And now I'm uh, very proud to introduce uh, Massimiliano Tarozzi and Dennis Francisconi from Italy to you. Um, Massimiliano Ta uh, Tarozzi is mainly now at uh, uh, UCL in London and um, part-time uh, at the University uh, of Bologna in the Institute of Life Science Studies there. Life Quality Studies, sorry. And Dennis Francisconi, he is a um, contract professor at the Unity University of Verona. And the research subjects are one, on the one hand, the phenomenological tradition of the Italian phenomenology. And the last uh, symposium, we heard a very interesting uh, speech of Massimiliano Terracci of the Italian tradition uh, based on Bertolini, and now, and this is the second spot of their research, is, um, and you see it here, an embodied education, and the, perhaps the, the comparison or the, uh, how they come together between pedagogy and the paradigm of embodiment. So, thank you very much that you are here, please. Good morning. Unfortunately, I cannot speak German. It's a very pity I'm forced to, to speak in English, which is not the best way to express phenomenological thinking. But, you know, this is nowadays a lingua franca of international communities, so I have to, to speak in, uh, in, uh, uh, in English. Um, well, first of all, let me thank you, uh, Malte Brickman, for this invitation and for organizing this, uh, um, this event and for choosing this, uh, uh, the, the topic of this year, uh, phenomenology and, um, uh, and, and uh, embodiment, which is, I think, is very relevant for the phenomenological, pedagogical, pedagogical uh, community. In our presentation, uh, Dennis and myself, we, work, we, we have been working together doing research for years. We would like to focus on the phenomenological legacy to the embodied theory and some of, it, of its implications for educational theory and practice. This presentation is organized in the following sections. Um, First of all, we introduce uh, the disembodiment in the Western uh, culture. We briefly introduced this. Um, the connected disembodied school, the, this, the concept of disembodied school, the embodied theory, and finally, we provide a, at least one example of what we call the embodied education, um, uh, mostly related to the early childhood education fields of experiences. But let me start from the beginning. Let me start from the very beginning. Uh, in John 1.1, it's written, as everybody knows, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the very origin of the centrality of logos in our Western tradition. How would our philosophical, spiritual, and cultural tradition have been if the initial lines of this Gospel of John was in the beginning was the body. The relevance and the supremacy attributed to the Logos instead of the Soma is central, is a central point to understand Western society and how we become what we currently are, especially in education. It's hard to say how, how different would have been our tradition. For sure, we know that the body was disregarded since the very beginning of the Western philosophy, even before Christianity. In Plato Republic, for instance, the body is considered nothing more than, uh, um, nothing more than a tool for physical exercise, for education, for the good citizen. In the Gorgias, the body, Soma, is notoriously defined the tomb of the being, the Sema. In order to pursue the true knowledge, 
the ideal forms, the soul must abandon the body, which is nothing else than an obstacle, or following Socrates in the Phaedo, an evil, to quote, as long as we have the body and the soul is contaminated by such an evil, we shall never attain completely what the desire that is the true, end quote. These words echoes those uh, of Descartes, um, of Descartes on the importance of the clear distinctive ideas, ideas that are not affected by sensations and emotions, which are unstable, unreliable, and measurable. Uh, the, 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 the prince of dualism uh, surely bring back to the, uh, the body into the philosophical discourse, but only to place it in the realm objects as an object among other objects, which can be easily inserted into uh, Cartesian access. But you never can expunge your body from your subjectivity, and Descartes should know that. In a famous letter replying to Christina Queen of Sweden, who asked him if the emotion played any role in cognition, Descartes wrote brutally by saying that the body doesn't count, doesn't count and emotions are completely useless for thinking. A few days after he dies of a cold and respir respiratory infection due to the cold weather in Stockholm, he should probably have looked after more carefully to his body and emotions. At the 20th century, uh, at the end of the 20th century, Michel Foucault nicely summarized centuries of Western forgetfulness of the light body by stressing the lack of recognition of a body knowledge. The body has always been regarded as an objective device, which requires a discipline to train it, strengthen it, make it useful, or even to control it by making it weak and punish it. Against this tradition, the phenomenological movement provided one of the first philosophical attempts to seriously take into account the role of the body in human experience, later followed by the first scientific attempt in the science of mind offered by the embodied cognition theory. Both phenomenology and embodied cognition theory try to move forward for the mainstreaming Western tradition, which is metaphysical, dualistic, materialistic, as well as mentalistic. Not surprisingly, this typical Western mind centrism, this logocentrism, which nowadays has become a formal neurocentrism, has had visible impact in Western school theory and practices. Um, um, all that is related to the body, movement, physicality, perceptions, emotions, are marginalized dimension in a school which promote an abstract knowledge centered on the rational thinking expressed through the word, preferably written word in the form of a book. It's not just a question of the marginalization of physical education, a problem that certainly exists and that recent reform are trying to overcome, at least in Italy, by increasing physical education school time and by formalizing initial teachers' education. More worrying is the prevailing physical education model which conceives the body as an object that must be maintained and preserved, a body machine that must work well in all its mechanism. This evokes the predominant notion of wellness and fitness diffused in the society for which sports and exercise are primarily aimed at aesthetic development or health promotion through active and healthy lifestyles. Nothing wrong with it, of course. But this is also confirmed the body machine idea and objectifies the material bodies as an outer and separate envelope wrapping the subjectivity. We claim that the major problem of the body forgetfulness at school is the lack of recognition of corporeality throughout the whole educational course as uh, the absence of the body knowledge entangled in all learning processes. In all learning processes. The body at schools play a role not only in the gym, but is everywhere, in all time, in both cognitive and experience learning processes, as well as in socialization processes and in education of emotions. How can practitioner recognize the role of body in all educational setting? Which pedagogical theory can provide a theoretical framework different from the mind-centered mainstream? In this paper, we argue that such a theoretical horizon can be found in phenomenology, even in its very origins. 
while the more sophisticated elaboration of embodied nature of mind is and certainly um, to be attributed to Merleau-Ponty, as we recent yesterday many times, whose entire work revolves around the theme on how embodied human beings experience the world. The body-mind live the connection can be tracked back in the early stages of phenomenology. According to Gallagher, an analysis of embodied aspect of perception and connection can be found in Husserl's early work, namely on his lecture on 1907 on Thing and Space. But this topic is mostly elaborated in, it, in Ideas too, where Husserl developed the well-known distinction between Körper and Leib, then further elaborated in the fifth Cartesian meditation. Subsequently, a theoretical elaboration of the key distinction between live and corpor, even before Merleau-Ponty, is resumed by other phenomenologists such as Max Scheller, Eddie Stein, to, to say, among others. Well, the German distinction between corpor and live is quite evident in, in, in a German language, but it's not the same in other languages, including Italian, uh, English, and French as well, which, which is, should be further uh, el um, elaborated, and we have to invent new words to translate this quite evident, uh, basic, and fundamental uh, distinction. This distinction is fundamental as a premise of the embodied theory and from its implication to educational level. On the one extreme lies the body thing, the organism, the machine, objectively existing in the world. This is the body of the traditional Western medicine. This joint from the mind, the material wrap of the soul from which is constitutively detached. In fact, as Gallimberti said, is a dead body. It is the body that must be exercised, trained, aesthetically, aesthetically embellished, but also disciplined and controlled, morally inhibited, sometimes concealed and covered. On the opposite lies the, li the lived body, the inseparable psychophysical unity, the body I am the perceiving or experiences body, the agentive body that moves in action. In Husserl's word, quote, the means of uh, any perception is, is the organ of perceptions, necessarily per participates in any perception, end quote. In the ideas too, not by chance, transcribed by Edith Stein, Husserl contains a, a vision of human as a psychophysical being where body and psyche are entangled in primary and inseparably way. Primary is one, another word difficult to translate. Uh, original, I, I don't know how to translate in English this. Therefore, he radically overturns the way of understanding subjectivity as light body and makes the mind-body world system inseparable. The body subjects lies pre-reflexive and pre-categorical in the light form, in the Lebesbelt, in the field of sensitive and perceptual experiences that is given in a primary, in a genuine way. Here, our body is essentially intentionality, is, the, is a directionality to the object, the natural disposition to orientate itself toward the object. Being genuinely opening to the world, once again, genuinely, originally uh, opening to the world, a live body perceived object around in, in terms of possibility it has to interact with them. In this sense, the body itself is at the center of our orientation within the world and at the very center of every perceptual experience. Thus, the perception of things in the world is a form of primary knowledge about things that is both sensory and motoric, and therefore constitutively embodied. In the Lebenswelt, the body comprehends its world without having to go through symbolic representations. This form of original and pre-categorical pre knowledge is largely, largely underestimated in schools particularly in the current dominant school dominated by the neoliberal discourse in favor of the abstract reflection that is important, but is come later. In some, in addition to cognitive knowledge through the form of symbolic representation overvalued at school, particularly in the secondary school, 
There's a form of pre-categorical and primordial knowledge that structures the subsequent cognitive and symbolic ones. To sum up our argument, according to the phenomenological view, original phenomenological view, body can be regarded along the following perspective, um, which um, have substantive and relevant implication for education. First, the body is a site of sensitive perception, what we shall call the aesthetic plan. It is the unifying dimension of all sensitive perceptions. Second, is the field of lived experiences. At Lebanese, the field of well, at Lebanese happens. The originating life world where subject makes sense to the world because they are naturally open to it. Third is the medium of the subject toward the other subjects. The body makes anthropathy or empathy, Einfühlung happens. The cognition of, of the other as a subject. Hence, the body structures the intersubjective inter relationship as an intercorporality uh, relationship and allow communication and language. Not to mention, and I don't have time to, 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 to deepen this point, that the body is also where eros and sexuality reside. The Italian phenomenologist Bertolini, that, that, that Malte quote before, argued that every educational relationship has an erotic and sexuate nature and highlighted the implication, consequences, and responsibilities of it. So what are some pedagogical implications of this phenomenological body uh, view? According to Bertolini, the, life, the lived body is where the construction of subjectivity for passive genesis um, is, a, is a, where it happens. From the one side, meaning and the psychophysical dimension primarily take place. So this is the passive genesis part. This is then complemented by the intentional acts that construct subjectivity for active genesis throughout meaningful lived experiences. These two educational processes, the two processes of construction of subjectivities have to be seen as integrated and simultaneously culti cultivated. So let me say a few words about sensitive perception. Since education can be phenomenologically regarded as a process that promotes and develops the constitution of subjectivity in all its aspects, the didactic activities aimed at the development of perceptual corporeality, corporeality are fundamental. They should not be reduced to a pure preparatory work for the most praiseworthy form of cognitive and disciplinary activities, especially in secondary schools, but they are fundamental per se. Phenomenology considers the lib as the pre-categorical ground where our relationship with the world is structured. The body allows the subject's perceptual life and is the vehicle to express our identity. Hence, a sensorial education plays a crucial role in formal education, especially, but not limited to, in early childhood education. Second point is life experience. A second part pedagogical implication is the focus on lived experience, on focus on erlebnis. Phenomenological pedagogy plays the notion of educational experience at the very heart of educational processes. Objects, facts, realities do not have meaning as such. According to Husserl, we only have an inadequate evidence of them. In education, more than facts, events, contents, objective realities, assessment, measurement, etc., are important the possibilities and the modes in which subject or students understood as a light body experience the world and other individuals, or better, intention, or better, they make sense to them. Therefore, experiential education or an education of the gaze, inviting to learn how to know, to look authent authentically to the world through God one's own life experience is vital. Conceiving education as a lived experience leads not to focus solely on the teaching learning processes, cognitive teaching learning processes, by developing the most effective methods for transmitting content and measuring achievements, but is aimed at highlighting the meaning of learning for subjects and to foster a critical perspective towards those models of knowledge univocally and objectively given. Okay, as a second answer to the disembodiment of education can be found in another phenomenological driven perspective. 
the embodied cognition theory. We, we claim that this, another, this is driven by phenomenology as an outing of the encounter between phenomenology and cognitive science. And Dennis will talk about this briefly. Thank you very much, and uh, hello to everybody. It's nice to see some friends and colleagues, uh, people that I met in the last years, and even some students of mine. Uh, I expect some questions from you at the end of the, the presentation. OK. Um, so cognitive science, uh, going back to um, the Gospel of John, from the cognitive science point of view, we should say that the, in the beginning was the brain and only the brain. Um, in this part of the presentation, I want to introduce a research program within cognitive science called Embodied Cognition Theory. We want to do that because this program directly derives from phenomenology, and it is somehow a challenge to phenomenology. As you see there, there is a brain in a vat, and uh, it looks like the brain is having some fun going outside uh, in, in the sun. Uh, the, re the rest is missing, whatever is the rest. This is a basic assumption for cognitive science, traditional cognitive science, um, which started in the 40s and 50s during the so-called Macy conferences. It was almost based on cybernetics to contrast behaviorism of the time, and uh, it proposed the application of computers to the study of the mind. It was the first time in uh, applying computers to the study of the mind. Um, the main theorists there were uh, Alan Turing, for example, uh, John von Neumann, and Norbert Wiener. At the same time, there was a small root within that tradition, a small root um, that started to grow uh, thanks to Gregory Bateson and uh, Margaret Mead, who were present at that conference, who were participating to the beginning of cybernetics and, uh, and um, cognitive science. Uh, the difference is that Turing and von Neumann, they were using the computer as metaphor, while uh, Maturana, Umberto Maturana, Gregory Bateson, Margaret Mead, and James Gibson were using uh, more natural metaphors. For example, it's some famous book like Mind and Nature and the Tree of Knowledge of Maturana and Varela and the Mind and Nature of Gregory Bateson and even towards an ecological mind or, ecology, or ecolo ecology of mind of Gregory Bateson. So I think already the metaphors they use says very much about the epistemological background. Um, so yeah, it's clear that cognitive science derives from uh, Western tradition, mainly Cartesian model since the very beginning. And cognitivism was the main paradigm built on the scientific study of mind in terms of internalist, instructionist, and symbolicist assumptions, reducing even the most basic and practical forms of intelligence and knowledge to abstract formal function and acontextual models of the world. These abstract models are stored in the brain and detached from real life experience. Everything happens in the brain, and that's it. Uh, and this is the example of the brain in a vat. Uh, but as said, uh, there was another tradition, and um, at the beginning of this tradition, I, I mean, uh, the, this other tradition at the end is called the Embodied Cognition Theory, and uh, it has two um, other, um, let's say, founders. One is Merleau-Ponty, even if Merleau-Ponty very often is not recognized as founder of cognitive science, but some people believe so. And that's, I think, very much interesting. Um, and one of his most interesting move is the fact that he brought the scientific approach to phenomenology. Um, the best example is, for example, the phantom limb uh, that I think someone was mentioning yesterday, uh, analysis in, um, well, all throughout his work, where he combines phrenology, the neuroscience of his time, and uh, phenomenology. That was the first attempt to combine this kind, these two areas, and he, he was the guy doing that. And then Uber Dreyfus, um, who is, um, he, was a uh, con he tried to connect continental uh, philosophy and analytic philosophy uh, by bringing phenomenology into American cognitive science in the 70s and 80s. Um, he was trained in phenomenology, and he was working in the field of artificial intelligence. So you can imagine trying to combine phenomenology and artificial intelligence in the 70s and the 80s in the United States. He has had very hard time there. Um, 
uh, yeah, even yeah, some professional he, he underwent to some pro um, professional and even personal attacks because of that. He wrote a book in 1972 entitled "What Computers Cannot Do," uh, and then he he received many many critics. And uh, 20 years after, he wrote another book entitled "What Computers Still Cannot Do," and. Uh, Unfortunately, he died this year at the age of 90. I think it's uh, nice to, uh, to remember him here. Uh, and so finally, then, we have the embodied cognition, the real structure of embodied cognition that was uh, founded in 1991 by Varela Thompson Roche, uh, where they, when they published The Embodied Mind, Cognitive Science and Human Experience. The book is a cornerstone, um, cornerstone uh, for uh, AC. And body cognition is based on four pillars, quite strange, phenomenology, cognitive science, evolution theory, and even Buddhism. Uh, so one might have some concerns about the stability and the theoretical solidity and consistency of such a paradigm, such a mix uh, of disciplines. However, it seems to have worked out quite well, because nowadays, embodied cognition theory is a very well-affirmed uh, paradigm in cognitive science, and people are working on all this area and many others, especially in um, bring, uh, uh, combining them. For example, people working on neuroscience of contemplative practices, uh, people working on neurophenomenology, these kind of very strange things that we still have to <laughs> fully understand ourselves. Um, Yeah, let me. Um, oh, sorry, a second. Okay. Um, okay. Um, nowadays, this paradigm is uh, supported mainly by some scholars that probably some of you know, uh, Sean Gallagher, even Thompson, Dan Zavi, especially, probably, and uh, Andy Clark. Um, so the basic assumption of um, embodied cognition theory is that the mind, whatever it is, is the base and depends on a triangulation made by brain, body, and environment. The mind is nothing less than an emergent process that depends on this structure. Uh, this is their main idea. And uh, the, there, are, there is a huge uh, literature that embodied cognition theory has developed on the role of the body on cognition. First of all, let me say that one very well-known result is that sitting for a long time is dangerous. But you, are, you have been sitting only for a few minutes, so it shouldn't be too dangerous. But that's, that's uh, quite well-known, but especially um, standing helps uh, learning and movement facilitates learning and uh, cognitive performance, even uh, preventing neuronal degradation and so on. That's very well known. But especially action-based uh, um, uh, learning, um, which is a classic example, particularly cited by the sport psychologists, as evidence that neurocognitive function and their bodily realizers, uh, realizers must be studied together, should be studied together. Um, in this case, reading comprehension and memory improve if the subject, while reading the description of certain physical activities, for example, baseball uh, action, uh, performs physical manipulation that are consistent with, with this action. So you read something and you, do, you perform some physical manipulation of objects. Um, this, the action-based uh, theory of reading comprehension asserts that the sensory and motor systems are involved during the process of understanding, imagining, and remembering an action described in a written story. Basically, the body helps understanding abstract symbols. That's, I think, quite a huge uh, switch, not only in cognitive science, probably. Um, uh, why I'm always skipping? Okay, all these results and many others that are now piling up say that we don't only need to get rid of the brain on, on, uh, in the VAT idea, but also the body on the chair idea. Um, this is an issue that pertains also to researchers and scholars in the field of ergonomics and educational architecture uh, to, to move away from the chair, let's say, in the classroom and not only. Uh, 
We believe that we need to completely change our instruction of spaces following indication that comes from and body cognition and phenomenology in order to promote a new role of the body in educational settings, opening up the class, opening up the class and the schools, so dismantling the panopticon, uh, panopticon model that the modern school is, uh, which is, at the end, this one. Um, let's see a couple of examples of areas working on the body in education. Uh, specifically physical education and embodied learning, so-called embodied learning. We have some problems with them. First of all, which kind of body does physical education promote? The name already says everything, physical. In the, this is completely in line with the Western tradition. So it's an education of the physical, that is an education of the corpa. corpa. Um, physical teachers, physical education teachers are restricted already in, in the name of their profession to the physical dimension of the body. This makes absolutely clear the tacit Cartesian and cognitive assumptions of this approach. Uh, in physical education, the body-mind connection is reduced to, to the material, physical, and instrumental movement aspects. Uh, in, in this way, the body becomes simply an executor and servant of Her Majesty, the mind. Uh, usually, educational goals in physical uh, education are sport, performance, motor coordination, balance, strength, endurance, speed, sport rules acquisition time to time, and sometimes uh, ethics in sport. Maybe, perhaps, well-being as well. However, nothing about relevant phenomenological topics such as body image and body schema or live and corporate distinction. Uh, we think that we should implement training programs for physical education teachers in order to teach them at least the basic phenomenological concepts in order to support them to reconsider body-mind connection um, and to adopt another perspective on the body-mind problem. Um, and then embodied learning so on one side, we have physical education, which is a sort of physical training, at the end, focusing on physical uh, training. And then physical uh, embodied learning, a recent approach uh, in cognitive science is called embodied learning. Prom it proposes to combine embodied cognition and learning, mostly school learning, like math, physics, and chemistry. So students play either in real or in virtual reality with objects. They use their body to learn astronomy, for example, or orbits, planets, orbits, orbits these kind of things. Here again, the body is somehow a tool, a tool to reach a knowledge that is somewhere else over there. Uh, so again, the phenomenological dimension is completely missing. Uh, this approach helps in learning um, school subjects. That's quite, quite sure. Um, but the risk, however, is to replicate nothing else than the old abacus. So uh, virtual reality doesn't move very much away from the quite old abacus, which is, at the end, uh, a, a tool where you use psychomotoric games or exercises to learn uh, writing, reading, math skills, basic cognitive skills. Uh, so in synthesis, both of them have a couple of problems, we think. Um, they are mainly focused on learning and instruction, not on education as paideia or education as building. And second, in both of them, the body is reduced, once again, to res extensa, pure, pure, uh, pure matter. Um, an example that um, we believe to be interesting from, from Italy, we have two, but I think we will make only one. Um, the attention paid to the bodily dimension in early childhood education and care in Italy has a long pedagogical tradition. Back in the 40s, Maria Montessori highly, highly evaluated the sensorial work in her school. The child, to her, is a sensorial explorer. Afterward, from the seven, uh, 60s and 70s, some innovative experiences promoted by progressive municipalities transformed early childhood education from social and welfare central uh, service to educational one. Here, the educational role of the body and movement have been central to the pedagogical project of these schools. First of all, spaces are designed as sites that allow the development of perceptual and sensory abilities. Again, it's a matter of architecture and ergonomics. And second, uh, ludic expressive activities are taught to foster the full development of sensory motor skills through the use of various nonverbal languages 
expressive and motion games, graphic, figurative, plastic, manipulative, mimic, gestural, and sound music activities. Okay, um, conclusions. The problem we are dealing with, probably, is not uh, only the problem of the body in education or in phenomenology. It is more than that. Uh, it's the problem of the body in Western history and society. The mental, neurocentric society we are living in requires a deep reconsideration of its metaphysical roots in order to accept the body as life and not only as a co -op. The phenomenological tradition, however, both at its origin and nowadays, including uh, body cognition, offers an horizon to support the necessary rethinking uh, of the role of the body in education. Uh, in particular, we think that we should move from the body as object to the lived body within the school settings. That is another kind of education that is not, shouldn't be physical education or, or sort of reform of physical education, I don't know. And transforming educational experience in lived experience through the rediscovery and full acceptance of the sensory motor nature of the mind, cultivating pre categorical sensorial dimension of human experience. So following, again, the Gospel of John, uh, we would like to say that the word became flesh, but the logos and the mind became embodied, but actually it's not like that, uh, not yet. Uh, but we think that hopefully we are going in the right direction, and certainly this uh, conference uh, went in the right direction, in our opinion. So thank you very much.